Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, we will be continuing the reading of the Ta'aleem of the, the book of Fadali A'mal written by Shaykh al-Hadith Manu Zakabir rahmatullahi alayhi from the chapter of Salah. Hadith number one. Hazrat Abu Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu narrates that he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Islam is founded on five pillars, bearing the witness that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and apostle. Establishment of Salah, paying of Zakah, performance of Hajj, and fasting in Ramadan. The Prophet ﷺ has compared Islam to a canopy resting on five supports. The kalima is the central support, and the other four pillars of Islam are to say the remaining four supports, one at each corner of the canopy. Without the central support, the canopy cannot possibly stand. And if any one of the corner supports is missing, a collapse will result if any of them are defective. Now let us judge for ourselves how far we have kept up the canopy of Islam. Is there really any pillar that is being held in its proper place? The five pillars of Islam mentioned in this hadith signify the most essential duties of a Muslim although a Muslim cannot do without any one of them. Yet Salah in Islam occupies a position next to only Iman. Hazrat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, Once I inquired of the Prophet وسلم, which act of a man was the dearest to Allah Ta'ala? The Prophet وسلم, replied, Salah. I then inquired which act came next in order of merit? And the Prophet وسلم, replied, Kindness to parents. I again asked what was next, next, and he answered, fighting in the path of Allah Ta'ala. Mullah Ali Qadi rahmatullah Ali has quoted in this hadith, in the support of the belief that Salah is the most important religious duty after Iman. This is further corroborated by a hadith in which the Holy Prophet Sallallahu is reported to have said, As-salatu khayru mawdu'ain. Salah is the best of all that has been ordained by Allah Ta'ala. Hadith number two. Hazrat Abu Dhar radiallahu anh, narrates that once the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out of his house, it was autumn and the leaves were falling off the trees. He caught hold of a branch of a tree and its leaves began to drop in large number. At this he remarked, O Abu Dhar, when a Muslim offers his salah to please Allah Ta'ala, his sins are shed away from him just as these leaves are shed away from this tree. In autumn, usually the leaves of the trees fall in great quantity, so much so that on some trees not a single leaf is left behind. The same is the effect of salah performed with sincerity and devotion. All the sins of the person offering salah are wiped off. It should however be remembered that according to the verdict of the theologians, it is only the sagail, the minor sins that are forgiven by the performance of salah and other services. The kaba'ir, the major sins, are not pardoned without repentance, sincere repentance. We should therefore, in addition to saying salah, be particular about doing tawbah, repentance, and istighfar, seeking the forgiveness of Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala may however pardon by His grace even the kaba'ir of any person because of his salah. Hadith number 3. Hazrat Abu Uthman an says, I was once sitting under a tree with Hazrat Salman an. He caught hold of a dry branch of the tree and shook it till all the leaves fell off. He then said to me, O Abu Uthman, will you not ask me why I am doing this? Do tell me, I entreated. He said the Apostle of Allah وسلم, had done exactly like this before me. While I was sitting with him under a tree, he caught a dry branch of it and shook it till all of its leaves fell off. At this he said, O Salman, Will you not ask me why I'm doing this? I replied, Do tell me why are you doing this, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He remarked, Verily, when a Muslim takes wudu properly and then observes his five times salah daily, his sins are wiped off just as these leaves have fallen off from this dry branch. He then recited the following verse of the Holy Quran. أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيِ النَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ Establish salah at the two ends of the day and at the approaches of the night 
Verily good deeds wipe out ill deeds. This is a reminder for the mindful. The behavior of Hadith Salman in the above hadith displays the profound love which the Sahaba ajma'in had for the Prophet They would often cherish the sweet memories of the time when the Prophet was living amongst them. They would, while quoting him, enact exactly what they had seen him doing at a particular moment. It is very difficult to cover all the traditions of the Holy Prophet which deal with the importance of Salah and which declare forgiveness for those who guard it. As had already been said before, the theologians restrict this declaration of forgiveness to the Sagha'ir, the minor sins only. But in the text of the Hadith, there are no such restrictions. My learned father gave me two reasons for this. Firstly, it does not really become a Muslim to commit any of the Kaba'il major sins. If perchance any such sins are committed by him, he cannot rest in peace due to inherent fear of Allah Ta'ala until he washes them away with his tears of repentance in crying before Allah Ta'ala. Secondly, the person who performs his salah with sincerity and thoroughness is very likely to do istighfar quite a number of times. Look for instance at the closing prayer of salah itself. Allahumma inni zalamtu nafsi dhulman kathira wa la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta faghfirli maghfiratan min indika warhamni innaka anta al-ghafur rahim O oh my Lord, I have wronged my soul, a great wrong, and none forgiveth sins save thou alone. Then forgive me and have mercy on me. Verily, thou art the forgiving, the merciful. In the above hadith mentioned, is made of wudu to be done properly. We should therefore be sure of the regulations about wudu and try to observe all of these. For example, take the case of miswak. It is a sunnah of wudu, but is very often neglected. It is said in a hadith that salah offered according to miswak is 70 times superior to the salah without miswak. In another hadith, use of miswak has been enjoined very strongly and the following benefits are attributed to it. It cleanses and sweetens the mouth and checks its bad smell. It is the cause of Allah Ta'ala's pleasure and a blow to the devil. It strengthens the gums and improves the eyesight. It is a pure against bile and phlegm. To crown all, it is a sunnah, the practice of our beloved Habib wasallam. As many as 70 virtues of the miswak have been enumerated by the theologians. It is said that a person in the habit of miswak dies with the kalima on his lips. It is mentioned in the hadith that parts of the body washed in wudu shall glitter on the day of resurrection. By this distinction, the Prophet wasallam will at once recognize his followers. Hadith number 4 Abu Hurairah narrates that once the Prophet asked his companions, Do you believe that dirt can remain on a person bathing five times a day in a brook running in front of his door? No, replied the companions, no dirt can remain on his body. The Prophet remarked, So exactly similar is the effect of salah offered five times a day. With the grace of Allah, it washes away all sins. Hadith number five. Jabir narrates that he heard the Prophet saying, The likeliness of five times daily salah is as the likeliness of a deep brook running in front of your house of a person who breathes five times a day. Running water is generally free from dirt, and the deeper it runs, the cleaner and purer it is. A bath in such water surely removes the dirt from the body and makes it clean. Salah offered with due regard for its essentials Likewise cleanses the soul of all sins. There, there are several hadith of the same meaning, though with slight variation in expression, narrated by different companions of the Prophet Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrates that he heard the Prophet saying, Each of the five salahs expiates the sins committed since the salah preceding it. To explain, let us take the case of a person working in a factory. His job is such that his body gets covered with dust. But there are five streams of running water in between the factory and his house. And on return from his job, he takes a bath in each stream. The effect of five times daily salah is quite similar. Any sins of omission and commission between two salahs are forgiven on account of istighfar and tawbah in each salah. The Prophet ﷺ, through such parables 
aims at impressing that Salah has the wonderful power of removing the sins. If we fail to avail of Allah Ta'ala's mercy, surely we ourselves are the losers. To err is human. We are likely to commit innumerable sins and acts of displeasing Allah Ta'ala and deserve thereby His wrath and punishment. But look how relenting our dear Allah Ta'ala is. He most graciously shows us the way to earn His mercy and forgiveness. It is a great pity if we do not avail of this great favor. Our Allah is always eager to show us His mercy on very small grounds. It is said in a hadith that if a person goes to bed with the intention of getting up for tahajjud and perchance does not wake up, he receives the full ward of tahajjud. Although he has been enjoying his sleep at the time of tahajjud. How boundless is the grace of Allah Ta'ala and what a tremendous loss and deprivation if you do not receive blessings from such a giver. Hadith number 6. Hudayfa says that whenever the Prophet ﷺ happened to face any difficulty, he would at once resort to Salah. Salah is a great blessing of Allah Ta'ala. To resort to Salah at the time of worry is to hasten towards His mercy. And when Allah Ta'ala's mercy comes to rescue, there can remain no trace of any difficulty or worry. There are many traditions concerning the practice of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. Similar was the practice of his companions who followed him in the minutest detail. Abu Dard says, When a strong wind blew, the Prophet ﷺ would immediately enter the masjid and would not leave until the wind had subsided. Similarly, at the time of a solar or lunar eclipse, the Prophet ﷺ would once start offering salah. Hadrat Suhaib informed the Prophet ﷺ that all the previous apostles of Allah, peace be upon them, also used to resort to salah in all adver adversaries. Ibn Abbas was once on a journey, on his way. He got the news of the death of his son. He got down from his camel and offered two rakah of salah, praying in tashahud for a long time. He then recited, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un and said, I have done what Allah has ordered us to do in his book. Qar Allah Ta'ala, wasta'inu bis sabri wa salah. Seek Allah Ta'ala's help with patience and salah. Another similar story is narrated about him. He was once on a journey when he received the news about the death of his brother. He descended from his camel by the roadside and performed two rakahs of salah and kept praying in tashahud for a very long time. After finishing his salah, he rode his camel reciting the following verse of the Holy Quran. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ Seek Allah Ta'ala's help with patience and salah. And truly, it is indeed hard except to the humble-minded. There is yet another story about him. On hearing of the death of a wife of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he fell down in prostration. When somebody asked him the reason, he said, Our dear Prophet ﷺ had joined us to prostrate in salah whenever a calamity was to befall us. What calamity can be greater than the death of the Ummul Mu'mineen? When, when Hadrat Abu Abad was about to breathe his last, he said to the people around him, I prohibit one and all of you from crying over me. When my soul departs, I ask every one of you to perform wudu, observing all of its essentials, and to go to the masjid and pray for my forgiveness. Because our gracious Allah has enjoined us to seek help with patience and salah. After that, lay me down in the pit of my grave. Nadr narrates, once it became very dark during the day in Medina, I hurriedly went to Anas to know if, it had, if he had ever experienced similar conditions during the time of Rasulullah wasallam. He said to me, Ma'adullah, during those blessed days, whenever the wind blew strong, we would hurry to the masjid lest it should be the approach of the last day. Abdullah ibn Salam narrates that whenever the members of the Prophet family were hard pressed in any situation or way, the Prophet would enjoin upon them to say salah and would recite the following verse of the Holy Quran. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقًا نَحْنَ نَرْزُقُكْ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلتَّقْوَى And enjoin salah upon thy people and be thyself constant therein. We ask not of thee to provide sustenance, we provide it for thee. And, there, and the hereafter is for the righteousness. It is said in a hadith that when somebody is confronted with a need, whether pertaining to this life or the hereafter, or whether it concerns Allah or a mortal, he should perform a perfect wudu, offer two rakah salah, glorifying Allah Ta'ala, then ask blessings for the Prophet and then pray as under. 
لا إله إلا الله الحليم الكريم سبحان الله رب العرش العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين أسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك والغنيمة من كل بر والسلامة من كل إثم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا حاجة هي لك رضا إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين There is no God save Allah the clement, the bountiful Glorified be Allah, the Lord of the tremendous throne Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds I ask thee all that leadeth to thy mercy and deserveth thy forgiveness I ask thee abundance in all that is good and refuge from all that is evil Leave me no sin but thou pardonest it And no distress but thou removest it and no need but thou fulfillest it, O most merciful of those who show mercy. Wahab ibn Munabbih writes, Have your needs fulfilled by Allah Ta'ala through Salah. In the good old time, if a calamity befell the people, they would hurry towards Salah. It is said that in Kufa, there was a porter who was well known for his honesty. People trusted him with their valuables and money, which he carried from one place to another. Once he was on his usual errand when a person met him on the way and asked him about his destination. When the porter gave him the required information, he said, I am also bound for the same destination. If I could walk, I would have accompanied you on foot. Will you kindly give me a lift on your mule from one, for one dinar? The porter agreed and allowed him to share the mule with him. They came to a crossing on the way. The person said, Now which road will you take? The main road, of course, replied the porter. The person said, No, brother, we should go by another road, which is a shortcut, and there is plenty of grass en route to feed the animal. The porter said, I have never been on this path. The person remarked, But I have traveled by this path quite often. The porter believed him and put the animal on that path. After some distance, the path ended in a very terrifying forest, where a large number of dead bodies were laying about. All of a sudden, the person jumped down from the mule and took out his knife with the intention of slaying the porter. Hold your hand, shouted the porter. Take the animal and its load, but do not kill me, said the porter. The person refused to re listen to his in entreaty and swore that he would first kill the porter and then take possession of the animal and the goods. Seeing that his entreaties fell upon deaf ears and that his cruel heart would not melt, the porter said to him, All right, if you must kill me, then permit me to say my salah of only two rakahs. The person agreed and remarked, You can please yourself. All the dead you see here made the same request, but their salah was to no avail. The porter started the salah, but could not recollect any surahs or ayahs to read with Fatiha, in spite of his best efforts. Meanwhile, the person grew impatient and pressed him hard to hurry up with his salah. All of a sudden, the following verse flashed to his mind. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ وَيَجْعَلُكُمْ خُلَفَاءَ الْأَرْضِ إِلَاهُمْ مَعَ اللَّهِ it is not he who answereth the wronged one when he crieth unto him and removeth thy evil, the evil. The porter was reciting the verse and the tears welled up in his eyes when a horseman suddenly appeared on the scene. He was wearing a glittering helmet and held a spear in his hand. He pierced the body of the pitiless rogue with his spear and killed him there and then. A flame of fire arose from the spot where the dead body fell. The porter fell down and prostrated and thanked Allah and finishing his salah, he ran towards the horseman and requested him to disclose his identity. He replied, I am a slave of him who answereth the wronged one. You are now safe and can go wherever you like. Saying this, the horseman rode away and disappeared. Indeed, salah is a tremendous asset. Besides pleasing Allah, it often gives us deliverance from the calamities of this life and provides us with tranquility and peace of mind. Ibn Sirin writes, If I be allowed to choose between paradise and salah of two rakahs, I would prefer salah. The reason is quite clear. Paradise is for my own pleasure. And the two rakah salah is for the pleasure of my dear Lord. The Holy Prophet ﷺ has said, Inviable is the lot of that Muslim who is with least encumbrance, whose main fortune is salah, who remains con content with humble provision throughout his life, who worships his Lord in a dutiful manner, who lives a nameless life and who dies in an early death, with very little to bequeath and very few to mourn him. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, Offer your salah at your homes quite frequently so that they may be blessed with Allah Ta'ala's grace and His mercy. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq to act upon whatever has been said and read. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Zakallah.